So it is time. It is time to move away from word problems and into a new topic of graphical analysis. Now, as we'll soon see, there is an astronomical amount we can do uh, now with calculus, with graphical analysis, that we could not do before. Let's move over here, consider this piece of a function, piece of f of x. Uh, now, I've chosen a piece. Of course, it's, it, it extends left and right. But I don't care about what it's doing extending to the left. I don't care how it's extending to the right. We are choosing just this piece from A to B on the x-axis. And more formally, instead of saying a piece of f of x, you'll see this in your problem, in your book, it's f of x on this particular interval, A to B. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, given this piece, what is the highest point on the graph? What's the absolute maximum? So visually, where is it? Right there. Yeah, right there. We can indicate that with a little dot. Absolute max at the top of that pretty bitty hill. Where is the absolute minimum on this piece? So nice. So yeah, the left end point right there. So that brings us, this nicely illustrates this first batch of definitions. We say that a function has an absolute maximum at a certain x-coordinate if the function evaluated at that x-coordinate is greater than or equal to every other function value for that piece. So this is the absolute max because to satisfy this, it's true for every x in the entire domain that we've chosen. So I gotta emphasize, if you're always choosing an interval, a, B, some piece of the graph, and then you work with it from there. And likewise, the absolute minimum follows the same definition. Every X in the entire domain that we've chosen. That's true. So that works good? Mm -hmm. All right, now I'm gonna do something a bit random, but bear with me. What if I were to pepper onto this piece some, uh, let's say, open neighborhoods, open sub-pieces, so to speak, so let's say one open neighborhood, one open uh, sub piece is right there. Let's say I got another one right there. So another one from there to there. From there to there and finally let's cap it off like so. So I have one, two, three, four, five open sub pieces, so to speak. Now, because they're sub pieces, uh, sub pieces and they're open, I'm not including the points that serve as the boundary for each one. Okay. So with that in mind, Look at this piece and tell me, for this piece, is there, an, is there a maximum point? Mm, I mean, if there are no spots, then there won't be, right? Or would it be the end point? But there's no end point. Yeah, there's no end point. So it's, it's for the same reason, you know, if your teacher were to ask you in a, like fifth grade arithmetic, you know, hey, what's the biggest number between zero and two and you include zero and two? Then of course you'd say two, right? Yeah. But you're here asking, what's the biggest number between 0 and 2, but you don't include 0 and 2? There's no such number. Yeah. No matter what number you pick, so if I pick like 1.9, you could just say, well, there's a bigger number than that. 1.99. And you could say? 1.999. Yeah. So there's no maximum value on this uh, sub piece, on this open neighborhood. And so there's no minimum value either. But what about right here for this, uh, this, this sub piece? Do you see a maximum or a minimum value? Well, the maximum would be like that vertex in that. Yeah, vertex-ish. A vertex-ish point. Yeah, just the, the top point right there. And that is our maximum on that sub piece. Even though we don't have a minimum, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm just interested in does it have a maximum or a minimum. How about for this sub piece here? Do you see a, a, do you see a maximum or a minimum for this? There's a minimum. There's a minimum right there. Likewise here, a maximum. How about for this last one, do you see one? Um, no. Yeah. No. So for what kind of sub pieces did we have maximum or minimum values? The second, third, and fourth. Second, third, and, second, third, and fourth. And how can you characterize that second, third, and fourth in contrast to the others? Slope changes. If there are slope changes, if there's a turning point, uh, yeah. Um, if there's a, if it's a hill or the bottom of a valley, top of a hill, bottom of a valley, slope changes, then you'll have what's called a relative maximum or a relative minimum. So let's look at this definition here. 
f of x has a relative maximum at a certain point. If this is true, the function is less than the function value valued at c. For every x, and I have two keywords, in some open interval containing c. It has to be open, um, because if I had, let's say, if I went over here, and I changed this instead of a parenthesis, I made this, uh, say, a bracket. In this case, you would have a what? A maximum. A maximum. But because we're defining a relative maximum in this way, um, for some open interval containing C, then uh, it has to be open. And the word sum is important because even though, let's say this point right here, even though this isn't the absolute maximum, I can still find a neighborhood, I can still find a subpiece, namely this one, for which it is the maximum on that piece. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And likewise for relative minimums. If you can find an open neighborhood, an open uh, subpiece, then um, it's a relative minimum. Now, there are two, at least two implications of these definitions. Sometimes uh, relative extrema are absolute extrema, like this example here illustrates. Over here, you know, this point was a relative extrema because we could find, it's a relative maximum specifically, because we could find uh, a subpiece for which it was the maximum on that piece. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the maximum on the subpiece, it's also the maximum on the, the whole piece. The whole piece, the entire piece, yes, precisely. So sometimes they're absolute extrema, as in this example, but in some cases they're not. Consider, consider this. Um, if instead this uh, entire piece had looked like this, then even though, you know, we have a relative maximum there and a relative minimum there, neither one of those is the absolute max of the absolute min, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Now you may think, oh, well, why can't you consider the endpoints relative mins or maxes? Well, endpoints are never relative extrema. So first, let me get some, some more definitions on the board. The way we refer to a uh, absolute maxes and absolute mins wholesale is with the term absolute extrema. That's just the phrase we say so that we don't have to keep saying absolute maximum and absolute minimum. Likewise here, these two terms, relative max and relative min, what do you think the, the umbrella term is that these guys fall Absolute to extrema. Relative extrema. Yeah. Relative extrema. Now, so endpoints are never relative extrema. They're never relative maxes, and they're never relative mins. Well, why? Because you have to be able to find some open interval containing C. But if I'm at an endpoint, let's say here, how in the world can I construct an open interval? There's, there's nothing here to the left of that, sorry, mm -hmm. to the right of it. I've shaved everything off to the right here. I've shaved everything off to the left here. There is no spot here. Mm -hmm. So we don't consider endpoints to be relative extrema. Gotcha. Make sense? Yeah. So, um, but now you may be thinking to yourself, okay, I mean, this is all very uh, well and good. This is all very interesting, but you know, what in tarnations does this have to do with calculus? I haven't seen a derivative once. Well, that brings us ah, to this new idea. So here I'm just copying down the same graph that was on the previous side of the board. And now let's say, uh, let's say this function is defined at some value c. If either one of these two things are true, the derivative evaluated at c is zero, or the derivative evaluated at c is, any ideas? Undefined. Undefined, remember we had a sharp point right there. If either one of those conditions obtains, then c is what is called a critical number of f, a critical number of your function f. Are all critical numbers either relative um, extremas or absolute extremas? No, no, it's not necessary.
What we can say for sure is that relative extrema only occur at critical numbers. Okay? But a critical number does not have to indicate a relative extrema at x equals z. It could indicate what's called a saddle point. So you see what I mean? Let's consider our familiar piece here. Right there. What was the derivative? See ya. How about there? Undefined. Equals undefined. And right here? See ya. And right here? I don't know. Zero. Yeah, zero. Why is that zero? Because it's flat. Well, there's Slip no it's flat. It is flat. It's flat. Now, we know, we know, that that point there, that point there, and that point there are our relative extreme. These two are relative maxes, this one's a relative min. But even though the derivative right here, the slope is zero, uh, this is obviously not a relative max or relative min. You know, there is no open interval open neighbor that we can construct such that uh, there's a max or a min on that open piece. Okay. Okay. So that is just illustrating this point here. And this point is called a saddle point. So it's a saddle point as opposed to being the top of the hill or the bottom of the valley. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so before we get into calculations involving uh, critical numbers and absolute extrema and relative extrema, we first need to talk about a famously extreme theorem called the extreme value theorem. And it goes like this. If your function that you pick out is continuous on some closed interval that you pick out, A, B, then there will be an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum of f of x on that interval. And that absolute extrema, extreme on, singular. It must be either a relative extremum, so somewhere in the middle it needs to be a relative max or a relative min, or an endpoint. So let's take, let's take this uh, from the top here. The importance of this word closed. If I didn't have a closed interval, let's say I had a, a piece of a graph that looked like this. Is there an absolute maximum to this piece? Yes. No. There is, right there. But is there an absolute minimum? No. no. Oh, but now I see what you're saying. Now this is it. Take a piece like that. Is there an absolute minimum? Yes. But is there an absolute max? No. No. You need to have a closed interval in order to guarantee that there's an absolute max and an absolute min. What if it's a horizontal line? It's a horizontal line. That's still in keeping with the definition of absolute max and absolute min. Okay. Because that greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Mm -hmm. uh, but now there is something in calculus called a strict absolute max and a strict absolute min. Uh, in, this, in that case, you wouldn't have that or equal to sign. Okay. So the endpoints would still be considered both absolute maxes and mins on a horizontal line? Well, every single point on a horizontal line would be the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum. Okay. Given the definition. Okay. Now, if that, if that equal to sign was in the inequality, then it would be considered um, a strict absolute max or a strict absolute max. Gotcha. Now, I mean, that doesn't mean that uh, you know, if you pick out an open interval from some function that you won't have an absolute max or an absolute min. You know, here I have an absolute max, here I have an absolute min, even though you know my endpoints are uh, open, as it were. But I'm looking for a way that guarantees for any interval that I have an absolute max and absolute min, which, which means I have to have it closed. So that's not an if and only if statement, it's an if statement. Yes. Okay. So that's why the word closed is important. And the reason I emphasize the word sum is because even though a function in its entirety may not be continuous everywhere, that really doesn't matter for this theorem. Let's say the function y equals 1 over x. Of course, and does that famous little school really squared in the third quadrant, schools in the first quadrant. And where is this uh, function discontinuous? At x equals 0. It's at discontinuous x equals 0. But let's say I were I just pick out the piece from on the interval 2 to 3. 
on this piece, is it discontinuous? No. No. And that's all you need for this theorem to go through. Just the piece of the function you pick out needs to be uh, continuous on the closed interval you pick. Now, as you can see, there will be an absolute max and an absolute min of f of x on the interval. And that's either going to be a relative extremum or an endpoint. So I consider this. In this, in this example, both your absolute max and your absolute min are the what? Endpoints. They're the endpoints. Here's a situation where they're both. Neither. Yeah, but yeah, they're, they're near the end, not the endpoints. But your absolute max is this relative this, extremum this right there. Yeah. Your absolute min is this relative extremum right there. And again, you can, you can mix and match. I think the, the one we had in the previous uh, example, you know, our absolute max was a relative uh, extremum, mm -hmm. but our, rel our absolute minimum was our endpoint. So there's a, you know, a variety of things, but whichever, uh, whatever your absolute extremum is, it has to be either a relative extremum or an endpoint. That make sense? Yeah. All right, now, with that out of the way, let us look at some calculations with critical numbers, absolute maxes, absolute mins, relative maxes, and relative mins. Now, here we have a function, x to the 2 thirds. I'm only picking up the piece on this interval. And for that piece, I want to find the absolute max and the absolute min. First thing I want to do is I want to find my critical numbers. So to find the critical numbers, what do you do? Um, you find out when the first derivative is zero undefined. Yeah. So the derivative of this guy is what? Um, two third x. Two third x. Minus one third. Precisely. And that is the same thing as two over three times the cube root of x, right? Yeah. Okay. So I want to set it equal to zero and solve for the values of x to make that a true statement. And I also want to solve for the values to make it undefined. Now, for this one in particular, is this thing ever zero? No. No. So I only want to look at the case where it's potentially undefined. This thing is undefined when x equals what? Zero. Yes. When x equals zero. So zero is one critical number. And that's my only critical number. Now. Is this critical number inside my interval of interest? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to check it off. That's an important one. Now all you got to do is plug your critical number into your function. What is f of zero? Um, that'd be zero to the two thirds, which is zero. Zero to the two thirds, which is precisely is zero. What if, so that's my critical numbers, and remember, your relative extrema only occur at critical numbers. Mm -hmm. So if this, if this is a relative extrema, it's my only relative extrema on that interval. Okay. So now that I'm done with the relative extrema, I want to test the what? The endpoints. The endpoints. So let me write this three. I'm going to stick three in the original. What is three to the two thirds power? That's going to be the cube root of? Nine. Cube root of nine. Of course, now you got to test your left end point. What is f of negative two? Well, that is negative two to the two thirds, which is the cube root of four. Negative two, the whole thing squared, yes, sir, is four. Now, all I have to do is look at these values, these three values. These are y values, these are vertical values, and pick out the biggest one, pick out the smallest one and put them in their point form, and I'm done. What is the smallest y? Zero. Zero. So I have an absolute minimum at zero, zero. Of course, what's my biggest value? Um, cube three, root of nine. Cube root of nine. Yes. So my absolute max is expressed in this point. All right, any questions about that? You look like you have a question. Yeah, where did you get the three from? This three? Right there? Well, we're plotting the point. F of three is cube root of nine, you see. Which, which three are we referring to? This one, this one, and this one? Think of the first three. F of three. 
Oh, because remember, the, the, the consequence of the extreme value theorem is that absolute extrema, an absolute extremum, must either be a relative extremum or it must be an endpoint. Okay. So I've tested my relative extremum. That's my only relative extremum. Um, and I've also tested the endpoints. Okay. And without it, I've exhausted all my other possibilities and I'm done. There are your absolute extreme. By the way, the graph of this thing, f of x is x to the two thirds, looks something like this. It extends in a square kind of fashion to the left, to the right. It extends also in the same way as in a square sort of fashion to the left. So you can see it's undefined at zero, but that doesn't mean it's. I'm sorry, its slope is uh, undefined at zero, but the function is still defined there, still continuous there. Gotcha. Now then, let's move on to a nice, nice polynomial. Find the absolute extremum of this uh, cubic. What is my first derivative? Remember, I'm looking for critical numbers now. 3x squared. 3x squared. Minus 6x. Plus three. Plus three. Yes, sir. Now to find critical numbers, I need to set this thing equal to what? Zero. Zero? Or undefined, but is this ever undefined? I don't think so. No. It's a nice continuous prep. Now then this thing equals zero. When let's see. I can factor out a three from each term. Mm -hmm x squared minus 2x plus 1 equals 0. Can I do anything with that quadratic? That's x minus 1, the whole thing squared? Yeah. 3 times x minus 1, the entire thing squared. And that equals 0, obviously. When? x, x equals 1. x equals 1. Now, is 1 in the piece that I've picked out? Is it on the center? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to test that. That's my critical number, my only critical number. So I want to find what f of 1 is. I also want to test my endpoints. What is f of 2? And what is f of 0? Oh, right. So I start with the low hanging fruit. What is f of 0? 3. 1. Oh. 1. Okay, remember, plug it in the original. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're trying to find the absolute max and absolute minimum of the original graph. And this is your original graph. Okay. That's the Oh, if I stick a 1 in there, what do I get? I think you get it. Um, That's going to be two. 2. 1 minus 3 plus 3 plus 1, which is 2. Now, f of 2, let's see. Oh, That's going to be 8. Minus 12. Plus 6. Plus 1. Plus 1. What does that come out to be? Um, 15 minus 12, which is 3. Minus 3. Yeah. Which of these is my biggest y value? F of 2. F of 2, oh yeah. Two. F of 2 is your biggest y value. What's your smallest one? F of 0. F of zero. Yeah. So my absolute min? Are just the endpoints. It's actually just, uh, just the endpoints. And that makes sense because it's a cubic function, I guess. And there you go. So, any questions about that? Okay, now we got our last problem. This one's going to be a bit harder because the derivative of this is harder, but it's the exact same process. We take our first derivative and we find the critical numbers using that. Now, someone tell me, what rule am I going to have to employ when I take the derivative of this function? The product rule. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. I keep the next term the same. And then plus x squared times what? Um, negative 1 times um, 10 minus x to the negative 1 third. Um, we've got to do power rule. Okay. So the 2 thirds. Two thirds, yeah. Right? yeah. Two -thirds. 
like so to the negative one third, and this negative one here is a consequence of the chain. The chain. Right. All right. So let me uh, let me tidy this up a bit. This I can make a minus sign because of that negative one. So it looks like that. I can write this in fractional form then. As the first term kept the same, but now the second term is gonna be minus two x squared all over b times the cube root of 10 minus x with one third or the cube root of 10 minus x. Yeah. Okay, what am I gonna have to multiply top and bottom by? So let's say make this one fraction. I'm gonna take this and do what to it? To make a one fraction? Yeah, I wanna combine these two terms okay. to get one fraction. But in order to do that, I need a common one. A uh, denominator. A common denominator. So you can multiply both sides by um, the all times 10 minus x. Exactly, right? just whatever is in the one, just times that. Make some more space. So 3 all times 10 minus x to the 1 third over itself. I'll see what pops out of this. Of course my bottom is 3 times 10 minus x to the 1 third. But now my top would it be just six all times six x all times ten minus x? Yeah, one third plus two thirds is that gives you an exponent of one. Of one, six x all times ten minus x, and then minus two x squared. So first, let's set this thing equal. Let's say to undefined. What x value makes this entire expression undefined? 10. 10, yes. When x equals 10, is 10 defined in my original function? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be 0 times 2 thirds times uh, 10, which is 0. So it's defined there. It's undefined for the derivative. Is it in my area of interest? Yeah. OK, so it is a useful critical number. Oops. Now. I'm going to set it equal to zero, but before I set it equal to zero, what should I do to the top? Simplify it. Yeah. Sim simplify it a bit. So, let's see, you get... Minus 6x squared, minus 2x squared, so 60x minus 12x squared. 8x squared. squared. 60x, like I said, minus 8x squared. And now it's very convenient to set it equal to zero. Well, actually, I can actually do one more thing. It's well, one that's third. 10 minus x to the one third of the denominator. Yeah. Yeah, we're done with the denominator. But on the top, can I do any more to simplify this? You can factor out a 4. You can factor out a 4. Can I factor anything else out? An x. Yeah, so 4x all times uh, 15 minus 2x. 15 minus 2x, yes. And when does this thing equal zero? Um, when x mm -hmm. is zero or um, 15 over 2. Right, you just set each term in the numerator equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are critical numbers, but are they useful critical numbers for this problem? Mm -hmm. The zero isn't. The zero, yeah, zero is not in my piece that I've picked out. It's not in my, in my interval that I've picked out. So I don't care about that critical number but I do care about this one, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have two critical numbers to test out, two endpoints to test out, so all in all, how many values will I have to compare? Four. Four. All right, let's see here. Um, what is, start from the, low, the lowest one. Which is two. Yeah. What is f of two? That would be four. 4 times 8 to the 2 thirds, so that'd be 4 times, that'd be 16.
Four times eight to the two thirds, which is? Four times four, which is 16. Which is 16, how about, let's go ahead and do the endpoints first. Okay. What is f of 10.5? All right, so when you plug this into your original, let's say you get 10.5, the whole thing squared. I may need a calculator to help with this problem. 10.5 squared all times 10 minus 10.5 squared, or just 10 minus 10.5, all to the two thirds comes out to be approximately what? Got 69.45. 69.45. What about um, f of 10? Well, that'd be 100 times zero, that's just zero. Right, so now I'm plugging my critical numbers. The first one is the 10, I plug it in, I get 100 times zero, which is zero. And finally, the last one, the last critical number to test is 15 over two. What is f of 15 over two? Let's see. That's gonna be 15 over two, the whole thing is squared. Or you could say 7.5. Um, 10 minus that to the two thirds. What does that come out to be approximately? 103.613. 103.613. And again, I have four things to compare. That and that, which are the points generated by the critical numbers. Y values generated by the critical numbers. And then these two, which are the Y values generated by the endpoints. The endpoints on the interval. Yeah. Okay, which is the smallest number? F of 10. Right, that's your smallest y value, your smallest function value. So your absolute min for this problem is 10 comma what? 10 comma zero. 10 comma zero. And finally, your absolute max comes out to be 15 over two or two or 7.5 comma. 103.6. Yeah, about 103.6. So a much more uh, intricate problem, much more involved problem than the previous two. Um, we, had two we, had, we had an actual critical number this time. We had two critical numbers with two endpoints and more to test out, more stuff to do with your derivative. But the thought process is exactly the same. Find your critical numbers by setting your first derivative equal to a zero and undefined. You get those critical numbers. You see if they're in the original function. You see if they're in your domain. And if they are, then uh, you plug them in. And after you plug those in, you plug in the endpoints, do some do a bit of comparison, and you are done. Thanks. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thanks. What is that? How much do you want? It? Thank you.